Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben, and today we are wading back into the waters of excitement. Uh, there's no way around it. Last year, we tried something nuts. We tried a draft show of the top 25 players under the age of 25, and uh, the show was wild. It was crazy. It was controversial. It got everyone even angrier than usual. Although Cody, I feel like this this year people they're they're already they're already kind of on edge. They're, we all we're already getting a lot of controversy. Like I did not think there would be controversy that Joel Embiid is good at basketball this year. So I can only imagine what's going to come of this episode where uh, we draft the top twenty five players under twenty five. How are you feeling emotionally for this exercise that doesn't upset anyone? Well, I can already smell the torches burning in the distance, like the pitchforks are being sharpened. It's not and too I late th- to go back. We could change the episode right now. The tough thing about this episode is, like, I feel like there are so many players that I could take in any number of orders, but the issue is that some people are going to take the orders, like, really seriously. Yes, like, yes. Like, you're going to be like, yeah. wait a second. You took so and so sixteenth instead of thirteenth. Thirteenth, yeah. yeah. Do you even watch my team? Like that's the kind of reaction we're gonna get, and I I don't know. I'm I don't know if I'm ready for that, but uh, come at me, everyone. I I want your smoke today because I'm about to give it with all of these guys. So if if you're a new listener, normally when we do like serious lists. I don't like a list. I don't like two, three, four. We talk about the ranges a player has, and we talk about sort of the low end and the high end and the idea of uncertainty and what we're trying to pinpoint in a player. And we will talk about strengths and weaknesses as we go through these players. We will talk about the context of these players. But the crazy thing about this by doing a draft is, as Cody just said, we don't really have the time to say, here's 82 games in the playoffs. Here's three years of sample we're talking about. And this is the sort of certainty we're dealing with. The whole point of this exercise and the reason why I think we're going to try it again as a, as a wild and crazy unhinged draft is it's unflowing in real time. Like there's a lot of uncertainty after only 30 games into the season. But because it's young players, I think it's kind of fun and worthwhile of, of an exercise to pinpoint where we are after the first trimester. So that's the goal for this. It wouldn't quite hit the same if we did a draft at the end of the year when we had the entire season in the books or the season in the playoffs. That's a separate bit of analysis. We'll do that at the end of the year with stuff like our top 10 or even when we do the sub, sub all-star team selections that we do in February after like two thirds of the season has passed. This is the fog of war kind of analysis, Cody. We we there's a lot of uncertainty here. Some of these players I haven't seen quite as much, and I'll talk through my angst about that when we get to it. Um, but otherwise, the criteria is pretty simple. If you turn 25 after February 1st, so your basketball reference age 25 season happens this year, you're disqualified. If you're older than that, you're disqualified. Everyone 24 and under is eligible to be drafted, whether you're injured or not, whether you're playing or not. Cody could really come out with a curveball and pick a player who hasn't played or maybe has only played four games. Um, But the idea is it is the top 25 players under 25. You can't be 25 years old. And the other simple part of this that's super important to remember, and I'm going to say it repeatedly because everyone who sends us nasty grams will certainly leave this part of the equation out. We are drafting for a playoff scenario right now. So the playoffs start tomorrow. You're on your team or another playoff team, and I have to realistically see how much value are you providing? How do you fit in certain places? Where do you provide impact? Not on a 15-win regular season team, not on a 37-win team that needs a 20-point score or something. I guess today it's a 30-point score. Um, But in the postseason, when you're the second, third best player, when you're the best player, when you are facing the best playoff defenses, and when those defenses are scouting and scheming and game planning for you. That's what we're doing. And uh, I don't know. Well, that, if you have any other words, you can jump in now. But otherwise, we're going we're gonna to start. Yeah, I was going to say, there's a, there's a couple of things that I want people to keep in mind when we go through here. Number one, we might end up picking players that – are having a worse season than other players. They might objectively be having like a worse statistical season or whatever else, but because of what we've seen in the past or whatever other analysis we'll bring to the table, we might end up picking somebody over them, right? That's a key thing. And number two, 
And by the way, you could probably hear it, right? My voice is a little froggy today. You sound great to me. You sound, oh. fan- you sound so ready to go. I think it might have been the pizza that was delivered at 2 a.m. And I just ended up eating the pizza. And here I am just out playing jazz. Are you, are you in know. Utah? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's exactly it. So you are. Okay. Can't trust those Utah on, uh the Utah on pizza places at two AM, Ben. That's yeah. just the, the short of it all. The yeah. other thing, Ben, that I want people to keep in mind is there's gonna be some people that are picked and someone might be like, Well, wait a second. That player wouldn't be able to be a primary on like a twenty three win team. I don't care about that. Like if we're thinking about like a good playoff team, you have to imagine a team that's like, I don't know, maybe around fifty wins or so. And are they actually going to be able to elevate that particular team into like better playoff contention? So I think there's an interesting inflection point where like, are you actually a good primary guy on a playoff team? Or are you just going to like, you know, I hate the phrase that's like a not winning player or something like that. But are you just going to be somebody that's able to put up like 25 and 12 on like a 22 win team? And I think that inflection point is pretty subjective. Uh, but I definitely keep it in mind with some of these guys that will probably go earlier than uh, other people might think. That's a great segue from the idea of empty stats to the first pick. Uh, Cody had the first pick last year. We agreed that it's only fair that I have the first pick this year, which comes with the immense pressure of not only picking first, but having to pick the 25th player at the end. I'll try to talk about some of the things that we just mentioned as we go through. I'll try to talk about where guys kind of fall in ranges or tiers in my head. Uh, But I can tell you right now that once we get to about 17 or 19 players, the last few players are going to be grab bags. You can go in so many different directions as the players become more clumped together. So with the first pick, without further ado, what do you say, empty stats? No one has emptier stats than this player. Uh, I'm so disappointed you're taking him. Yes. How is he he so young? How is he so young? (laughs) Uh, with the first pick, I'm going to take I'm going to take Luka Doncic, who uh, is is on a scorcher. We just had the video about him from the Christmas Day game. I think it was probably the best game I've seen him play. Now that doesn't fully adjust for the quality of the competition because after a while he just started sending Suns players in different directions. I don't know if Kevin Durant was under the weather in that game. He had a disastrous defensive game. But that's what great players do to defenses, Cody. They start tying them into knots, and they start creating miscommunication, and they start having guys panic. Like, you know, the the multiple times, three players going after Luka or, or Luka's passes or fakes or things like that. Not two, not two, three guys moving, and that just opens the court for everyone else with that gravity. So he's having an amazing year. Um, I don't think Dallas is a great team. I don't think they have great personnel there. So that always gets in the way when people are like, man, uh, why don't they win 55 or 60 games? Why aren't, why isn't he going to do it in the playoffs? I, I think he's shown that he's pretty playoff resilient with his skills. And I think this is the best he's playing. I think this is his best season. His defense has been a little bit more active. I don't think you're ever going to get like, great athletic man defense from him but these guys that kind of can use their brain and then read the game and make good rotations or stick their hands in passing lanes or things like that he's doing more of that this year so it was a pretty easy pick for me uh, at number one with Luca. I need to say this in no uncertain terms Ben because I don't think people have got the message yet Luka Doncic is a spectacular basketball player just an unbelievably brilliant player who, I don't know, by my money, probably uses visual manipulation on his passes more than anyone else in the league. Like, he's so good at looking off defenses and waiting for the last possible second to throw a pass either across the court or to somebody diving to the rim or something like that. Um, He's probably, like, easily in his own tier on this list. Like, he was number one on my big board, and I really don't think it was particularly close between him and and number two or number three. And, you know, I, I really like the next few players, but Luca is, you know, for what is he, 24 right now? Spectacular 24-year-old. Yeah, spectacular. All right, so now it gets fun. We're going to pass it to uh, Cody yep. with the second pick in the top 25, the 2024 top 25, under 25, thinking basketball draft of nonsense. Cody, wh- wh- who are you going to take? So... I was between a couple of different players, and I really think you can go a couple of different directions. But ultimately, Ben, uh, I landed on Anthony Edwards for oh, number two. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. He was in this tier for me. Yeah. Um, I don't think I would have picked him number two, though. Statistically, okay. he definitely, in the first 30 games of this season, 
has fallen behind some of the other candidates here as well. So take the floor. What are you thinking with Anthony Edwards? So I think there's like grouping of players here that I was thinking about between like him and then these other guys. For me, the thing with Ant is like I can see him just losing less of his value in the playoffs, right? He has fewer weaknesses that I think you can take advantage of, especially on the defensive end. Like I think some of these other guys that will be coming up can definitely be targeted quite a bit. Are uh, maybe one of them's not smaller, but they're definitely shorter than like the average. Uh, we'll say guards for right now. They're shorter than the average guards, and I think that can be kind of an issue. We talked about a little bit where like if you look at the history of great teams, championship level teams with players that are like under six three as their best offensive player. Uh, it's not like a great history unless you're like the bad boy Pistons or like the 2017 Warriors type of thing. And Anthony Edwards is just you know a six five guard, incredible at choosing his spots and getting to the basket. Their offense still, I don't even know if it's above water right now, but the fact that he's able to carry a, a solid offensive burden, I like the fact that he's not like a huge load guy. He fits pretty well next to other offensive pieces. And defensively, he can really ramp it up, right? And the jump shot, I'm feeling it a little bit more uh, each each year that I see him playing. And so just in general, when the playoffs come around, this guy that just isn't going to lose any value on defense or even offense. So uh, he's, he's a guy I, could, I think could be thrown into a lot of different team builds while holding his value. Okay, so this is already an interesting philosophical conversation to me. And this is I think this is why we use this quirky draft construction to get into this stuff, because you're forced to take Edwards over, oh, at least on my board that I'm looking at right now, most of the next players in this tier or the next tier have major kind of defensive question marks. We've either seen it or we're anticipating seeing it when you ramp up in the postseason. And that weakness on defense is going to be magnified because it's going to be targeted by the opposing offenses and their coaches and their top level players that are going to be in the first, second, third round of the postseason. So I agree with you. I think probably most listeners agree with you. Anthony Edwards doesn't have that defensively. He on the ball, fantastic. Off the ball, the awareness has been better. Obviously in Minnesota, he's in a pretty healthy defensive ecosystem right now. So we get to the playoffs, we can check that box. We get to the playoffs. Are you going to take away his tough shot making? No, you can check that box. You get to the playoffs. Are you going to take away his rim pressure? Doesn't seem like it. Just incredible ability to get into the lane, first step, draw fouls, attack the basket traditionally. So I get all that. I guess my question is, compared to some of these other offensive players, I mean, Cody, you're the one with the shtick about Anthony Edwards' shot selection, Mm. right? Which is clearly sort of one of the negative question marks. Uh, I think his decision-making this season has been better. You can see that in some basic decisions and actions. It was a late-game play in the Dallas game a couple weeks ago where the Mavs got ahead 17-2. to Minnesota slowly came back in the game by just playing great defense for the last two and a half, three quarters of the game. And in the fourth quarter, as Minnesota was sort of pulling away and icing this great road victory, Edwards has the ball in isolation, makes a post move, gets that up and under he likes where he kisses it off the backboard. And instead of shooting, as he goes up and under and leaves that first defender, a second defender comes over and he whips it to the corner to an open three-point shooter And then we get the beautiful hot mic Anthony Edwards moment where he starts yelling, yeah, (laughs) after he makes his own pass and his teammate hoists the three and drains it and they go up like nine and Dallas calls a timeout. I thought that one play perfectly captured the decision-making improvement where you're not some radical elite Nikola Jokic playmaker passer yet, but just realizing there are these moments where you can manipulate the defense and make more basic passes. I think that's all there. I think the only question for me and the reason why I wouldn't have picked him second if we had flipped the order here is, is the overall offensive playmaking scoring package as a number one centerpiece, is it actually in the same sort of tier or level or category of these other guys he's going against. I think you certainly agree. It's not up to the same level as Luca. uh, But the question is, I'm going to, I'm going to pick someone next and we can have the, with the exact question, but there's multiple players in this range that I think that was my question with him. No, I don't, I don't think that's uh, 
that's controversial at all. I think these other guys that are going to be coming up are clearly better offensive players than he is. But I also think going through the season, Anthony Edwards just seems like he's picking his spots a lot better. Like he's not always like revving the engine at full volume, but I like the fact that he can like really ramp it up at times. So uh, I see what you're saying. And I do think this is an interesting philosophical thing, but I do think that we are, and you might see this with some of my picks in general, size is good, Ben. You really want bigger guys. You want guys that aren't going to be picked on from different positions. And, you know, uh, when we watch like the finals from last year, I think Anthony Edwards could probably hang with any of those teams. So that's what I'm going with. The, the, the statistical profile is definitely not as impressive, but the vibes of what he brings to the table is what I'm doing with number two here. Okay. This is really putting me in a bind, Cody. I did not anticipate having to be in this position, uh, <laughs> but I think with the third pick, I think I have to do it. I think I have to do it. I, I think I have to take my guy, Reggie Miller 2.0 in Indiana, not because of the way he plays. Why do why does everyone do the, the put the keyboard down? People are always getting excited to be like Ben. Reggie Miller doesn't play anything like Tyrese Halliburton. No, he's the successor to the Midwestern Hoosiers legacy. And Tyrese Halliburton. Um, I I just believe Cody. I believe that he is a high level offensive player. He is special. The passing is special. I don't think he's the best passer in the history of basketball I don't think he's the best passer in the NBA but he's very high he's a he's a fantastic passer and playmaker the pace he plays with and the shooting um I can nitpick some things with him and I will in a second but the combination of his decision making when to drive when to shoot this is a guy who is a volume pull-up three-point shooter from deep at 41 percent making 43% of his wide open threes. And you're talking about, you know, one of the best passers in the game, the decision making, sometimes it skews a little conservative for me, but I think actually that's how he's able to create so much efficiency with his passes and his scoring game. He doesn't force drives into the paint. He's opportunistic. So if you play on his shot too much and he drives, if, if the help comes, he kicks it out or finds a way to punish the help. If, the help doesn't come or there's a huge gap, that's when he attacks and takes the shots at the basket. So he's not athletically a guy who's like Anthony Edwards, who's able to get up in the air and use physical force to have great efficiency at the rim. But if you look at his drive numbers this season, 64% true shooting on his drives, which is in the 87th percentile, that's way better than someone like Anthony Edwards on way more drives. And it's not because he's better at cooking people in isolation with his first step. It's precisely because he uses the shot to set up the drive and he uses the pass to set himself up and get the ball again. He's just a fascinating player, in my assessment, in the way he approaches the game, his tactical and sort of uh, creative approach to how to attack a defense. And that's why I believe even though there are things like we saw the Lakers throw size at him, there are little things that can chip away at that. I really believe in him as a high-level, elite, great offensive player in this league. So I struggled a lot with Tyrese Halliburton because I think there's like three players in this tier that's with Anthony Edwards, and uh, he was actually the third of the three. And it has nothing to do with like that I don't believe in Tyrese Halliburton. I'm a huge fan of his. I think the fact that uh, the way that he can shoot the ball, it helps him fit into other high-end talent very well. He dominates the ball a lot. But, like, it clearly works for them. Like, the Pacers have just an unbelievable offense when he's out there. And I think if there were other people that could have the ball a lot more and and create in that way, I think Tyrese Halberton would be able to, you know, play a little bit more off-ball and, and fit in really well in that way. The other thing, he's a big dude, Ben. Is he, like, 6'5"? He's like, right? he's like, he's like 6'5", but I assume you're going to segue to the, to the defense here because he's the biggest, but you've got the issue where uh, he's still on the on the weaker side defensively compared to some of the other players that will hit that have good defensive chops in this sort of uh, top 10 group. Yeah, I don't necessarily know if I want to go straight to a negative thing. I think his size is what intrigues me the most about him defensively. Like, if you get into a playoff series and teams are trying to target him, like, how much can he actually be targeted? Because we see, like, his ability to contest shots. He can recover really well. He's near the top of the league and blocking three-point attempts, which is a really obscure stat. But, like, it's pretty impressive per 100 possessions. He's able to get out there and contest people pretty well. He gets lost a fair amount, and he can get burned very uh, pretty easily. But, like, 
when you're six five versus somebody that's six two, I, I don't know how much of that value do you actually lose in the playoffs. But I do think when you look at the Indiana Pacers performance against top ten t uh top ten teams in the league right now, it's pretty poor, Ben. They have like a negative seven net rating against top ten teams. And it's because their their defensive rating is like a one twenty seven. And I know it's pretty early in the season, so like the sample size isn't very big. But like when you have a super offensively slanted team, I'm like, all right, how much of this is just kind of like juicing Tyrese Halliburton's offense? Like, what would it look like on maybe a more traditional team that you would expect to really compete in the playoffs? And like I said, I have no doubt he would be a spectacular playoff player, right? When you shoot that well, when you drive that well, when you pass that well, when you're 6'5", you're going to be pretty solid as a guard, right? But like... I just want to see it tampered down a bit. Like, I would like to see him on, like, a Timberwolves, like a defensively slanted team, and see what he's able to do in that sort of situation. So those are my thoughts on him. I think this is a great point you're landing on because one thing that Indiana does to me is they, like, don't send any help defensively relative to what you see with a normal team. So a normal team away from the ball, the players will sag off their man. The defense will tilt a little toward the ball side of the court. So you'll have multiple guys standing in the paint. The Pacers, compared to normal teams, are much closer to their man. Sometimes it looks like there's like only five players on the court instead of 10 because they're like glued to their man. That's a, that's an exaggeration, but I'm trying to make the point here, right? And so as a result of that, there are a lot of possessions that Indiana has where they play defensively in space and in isolation and they get cooked defensively. I think that helps the offense. I think there's an offensive sort of uh, uh, mad scientist thought behind this idea on defense because what that means is they can get out and run and they're already level with you to outrun you down the court. They're already in a position where instead of five guys being near the hoop, five guys are out where the offensive players are. So the second the Pacers' offensive possession start starts, they take off. Halliburton, of course, is a genius to engineer all that and push that pace. But I, I think there's a very clear defense to offensive trade here where just in terms of your defensive concepts, not to mention the personnel, you know, the more Buddy Heels and I mean, they play like Aaron Neesmith as their best defensive forward. Uh, and he's done a good job. He's done an admirable job. But it's just an offensively slanted team with a lot of shooters, guys like Ben Matherin. And I mentioned Heald and things like that. So there is an offense defense trade off. What would the Indiana offense look like without it? What would Halliburton's numbers look like without it? We don't know. But I think it's fair to say they wouldn't be as impressive. At the same time, as I said at the top, I'm I'm pretty sold uh, on Tyrese. So, okay. Fourth pick coming up. Now it's it's interesting. Um, back to you. Who are you going to take? This is great. This is a guy that I would have taken third on my big board. A player, Ben, that we have not seen very much of this season. But what we have seen, it's looking pretty solid, Ben. I'm taking John ja Morant at number four. John ja Morant, Cody, right now... Uh, He's only played four games as of recording this. He looks spectacular in those four games. I mean, can, can we just get into this for anyone who hasn't seen it yet? This guy is, first of all, we know about the superpower of finding like little seams in the defense and keeping his dribble alive and splitting double teams and navigating his way down to the baseline and finding a way to finish with a reverse or something like that. He's got... The obviously the great ball handling to split traps, get into the paint. We know about the, all of that for the last few years. Of course, once you do that, that rim pressure starts to open up the passing and you can collapse defenses and kick it out to open teammates. But the thing that's really jumped out to me this season in these first few games is he looks stronger. His balance is better because of his strength. He looks sturdier. So he hasn't lost a lot of burst, if any. He still has the same burst. But he can take hits and keep on going and drive through that contact. He can get into the paint, lower his shoulder a little bit as he, because he's so fast. He's, he's angling around you. Move someone off that contact. Push them back like a stronger, kind of bigger player that we would expect. LeBron James, that kind of archetype. Take that kind of hit and then finish. And uh, when you combine all that stuff, I mean, there's more to get into, but he just looks spectacular to me right now, right out of the gate. 
Yeah, and I think the the difference between him and some of these other guys that we'll be talking about is the jump shot, especially early on, isn't great. He's shooting in these first four games like 17% from three, which is not ideal from like an offensive centerpiece. But like you said, his ability to just keep the dribble going, right? Like he's able to, there's a pick and roll, splits the, the hedging defense, splits some kind of defense, gets into the paint. He hits somebody. He doesn't fall to the ground. He keeps the dribble going a little bit more. And because he's such an explosive athlete, He's able to jump in the air, and people used to talk about this with Michael Jordan in terms of, like, he'd jump in the air and, like, wait for other people to come down before he shoots. John Morant's passing manipulation in those situations is just incredible. Like, he can leap into the air and kind of look somebody off. People are, like, hanging in the air with him, like, is he going to take a floater? Is he going to pass this guy? And then, nope, he dumps it down for a layup. Or hangs up in the air, wait for someone to start cutting, and boom, hits him for, like, a layup pass, Right. And so when you have that combination of just like his his court mapping, his awareness of offense, of where his guys are going to be, along with his ability to just like get wherever he wants whenever, like there's a couple of plays where he like gets downhill, he immediately like sort of fakes this pass to somebody that's rolling, completely freezes the defense, and because he's so good with his balance, he takes this like weird loping step for like a layup. And, you know, people like, like to, you know, the TikTok trends, Ben, of seeing John ja Morant put his head near the rim. And you're like, oh, my God, John ja Morant's the best offensive player we've ever seen. It's not even those big explosive plays that are so impressive to me. It's his ability to, like, elongate the step and finish a layup. Or to, like, maybe wrong foot somebody and finish with, uh, with the offhand or something like that. His offensive ability to just kind of, like, make it up as he's going once he's already inside the arc with his dribbles. It's incredible, and it feels like he plays a lot bigger than he is. Like, when you look at him up and he's, like, 6'2", it doesn't seem like he's a 6'2 guy. Like, he seems like he's a couple inches uh, taller than that. So even though the shooting woes are there, the rest of the offensive package, to me, like, more than makes up for it. He's been so good in these first few games with that tempo, that pace, control, the strength, the ball handling to carve into the paint. And then the thing that's really jumped out to me is the, the passing manipulation the combination of I'm going to get up in the air and I can threaten you in the air, but once I'm in the air, I can make a pass. Uh, he has this incredible play from the Pelicans game where he does his sort of patented like jaw crossover where he throws it out in front of him and then starts dancing with his feet, gets to the left hand that he loves to get to, gets that he loves to get to gets up in the air like he's going to finish and at the last second throws a lob to the big instead to punish the shot blocking uh that with that that's a ridiculously high level read so the ability to blend all this stuff and jump in the air and pass in those situations with this like really crazy live trigger off the bounce that he has Cody so you have the ball handling that gets you into the paint but then you can whip it right off the bounce uh, like 90 miles an hour to shooters and other players. Um, the, the deliveries on some of these passes are really fantastic to start the year. I think that whole package looks really impressive, the control and the tempo of the game. Um, the interesting thing about me with Morant in general, which goes back a couple seasons, is you could almost say he pushes the button too much sometimes on his driving ability. Like, He's not 6'6 six, six or 6'9, six, right? He's 6'2 or 6'3, gets up in the air and can finish. But if you look at last season, for instance, he was second in the league in drive frequency, which tells an incredible story about someone who just cannot be stopped going to the rim. But he was just in the 53rd percentile in finishing efficiency on those drives. So you're getting there all the time, but you're kind of middle of the road in your efficiency finishing. And when we look at the ultra high frequency rim pressure guys in the league, the Zion Williamsons, the De'Aaron Foxes, typically those guys are like 8 to 10% ahead of where Jaw was last year. He was 55% true shooting last season on all those drives. And the best players in the league will be like 63 to 65 or 66%, something like that. And so... That is a really interesting thing where if you compare him, especially to someone like Tyrese Halliburton, who plays almost the opposite way, is he shooting a little too much at the basket instead of spraying it or being more opportunistic with those windows? And even in the first few games back, you see situations where he's like missing a couple dunks or uh, maybe the shot gets blocked a ton. And psychologically, we rarely think of that as like 
poor shot selection. But I actually think that's one of the questions about like, is can Jog improve and get that out of his game to get his efficiency and his overall impact to an even higher level? And that's a big part, I think, that juxtaposes him and like Anthony Edwards' driving game. Where and I think Anthony Edwards is able to like showcase his strength and size a little bit more, and he's a little bit more choosier with the ability to finish. John Morant kind of has this like, I'm going to take off and figure out what I'm going to do next. Like, I'm just going to take off from 10 feet away and try and dunk this. Maybe I'll do it with my left hand. Maybe I'll do it coming from this angle. You don't really know what he's going to do until, like, he's attempted it. So, yeah, I think that's a good point talking about his finishing that way. And like I said earlier, I like like it when he's a little bit below the rim with his finishing ability. Something else I like with his passing game, too, we talked about the manipulation. Just as, like... He's trying to push the tempo a little bit more, right? Like, I think, like, Desmond Bain is a great running partner with him where Bain can kind of get himself wide open, and when he's open for three, he's just going to bury it. So John Morant throwing these kick-ahead passes to try and, you know, just kind of push the offense a little bit, catch the defense napping for a second. He's like, oh, there's Desmond Bain. I'm going to kick it up there, and he's going to hit a three. You can see some of the rust when we get to the half-court possessions. Like, I think Jaw has been, like... He's like, oh, I can whip these like 100 handed passes, but they're a little bit off. Like you can see that he hasn't been playing for a little bit more. And I think even then, like he's been playing really well with some of these turnovers that he's been throwing. So you're like, I see the vision of what it can be once he's back into the rhythm of playing the NBA game again. And I think, you know, Tyrese Halliburton, he's 6'5". I think defensively, he could probably hang with his size a little bit more. I think Ja uses his, his athleticism to maybe try and make more defensive plays. Like, I think he had, like, a pretty egregious uh, uh, goaltend in one of these games before where, like, somebody, I think it was C.J. McCollum, like, drives to the basket and throws it up and Ja, like, makes a spectacular block, but it was, like, clearly not a legal block. Um, So, I don't know, he gets lost sometimes at screening actions and gives up layups and things like that. So, defensively, he's definitely, like, a negative and more of an issue on that end. But I do, you know, the offense being able to get to the basket get into the free throw line and things like that. Those are things that will hold up in a playoff situation. Well, the thing to consider about that rust is this is almost like his preseason and he's already playing at this level. And we know in the past, this translates to the playoffs. We know in the last couple postseasons that it's very difficult to keep him out of the paint because he just has that athletic advantage because of his ball handling, because of that comfort burst and aerial finishing and body control once he gets there to either draw fouls or finish. The passing doesn't break down against high-level defenses. He's still a fantastic passer. So I think he's tested as a playoff guy very, very well. I think the only question with Jaw is, to me, has the shot improved in any material way with another offseason with a break? Because last year, if you remember, the shot was back down to like 30%. He started three of 18 this season in a super small sample. So do we actually have any improvement on that shooting? Can he get the free throws from like the mid 70s up into the low 80s? For example, that would help him a lot as a guy that can get to the basket and pressure the rim. So I think it's just been a fantastic start. Changes the trajectory of the Memphis team entirely. And we know it's something uh, that translates into the postseason. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think we talked about it a little bit more on a previous episode where I think he just like he takes a lot of the burden off some of these other Memphis guys. So we saw their defense trending upwards recently. I wouldn't be surprised if we see that trend continuing just as, you know, guys like Jaron Jackson are taxed a little bit less. Guys like Desmond Bain are taxed a little bit less. So, you know, I think I think I don't think they're too far behind that they won't make the playoffs, especially if we're just looking at the play in. But the Western Conference and like those last few seeds, it's wide open, Ben. Like if the Grizzlies continue this trend these last few games, I don't see any reason why the Grizzlies can't make the playoffs. Well, that's a that's a conversation for another day. We'll have to table that one and come back to it. Now you've given me the impossibility of uh, the fifth pick in this draft. <sighs> did you have a clear? Did you have a clear number five here? I didn't have a clear. I mean, I have someone at number five, but it is very far from clear. Very far from clear. Uh okay. I this this is where it starts to get really hard for me. I think I'm going to take from this next group. Uh, I will take Tyrese Maxey. Hey, that's from who I this have next five. group. Yeah, uh, it's okay. So 
let's let's talk through this and and now that we're moving into the next groups we'll we'll probably be a little bit faster going through some of these players but the thing with Maxi is he is having a better season than most of the under 25 players in the league in this draft Mm -hmm. period just like in terms of the team he's on and the impact he's having and the way he's playing and the numbers he's putting up we can nitpick on the defensive weaknesses and we can nitpick on the fact that it's the regular season but I actually think the fact that it is the regular season. Philly's so good at bottom feeding so far to start the year. Maxie's in a really nice situation with Nick Nurse as the coach there. Uh, I do wonder how much you lose when you get to the playoffs. Uh, he was good in the playoffs last year, right? It's not this kind of thing where I'm like, Tyrese Maxie's game doesn't translate to the playoffs. I'm just saying, if you look at the, the results strictly from the first 30 games, I think you can make an argument that he could go like third in this draft. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not sure who to take next. I'm going to I'm going to err on the side of Maxi. He looks fantastic statistically. He's in the top 10 in like our box plus minus model in offensive EPM uh, over on dunks and threes. ESPN's old RPM. He's in the top 10. He's just he's just having a great year. And the thing that is going to make me sort of default to him here, the outside shooting, just an elite outside shooter combined with that speed to get to the basket pretty good playmaker like these other guys I question you know how much he can be targeted defensively in the playoffs I have that question about John Morant as well um Halliburton Morant Maxi there's actually a few other guys in this tier for me that we'll get to like this is all a question and uh I don't know I'm gonna default to him here but it starts to get really hard yeah, and I like the ability for him to be able to play off and bead so well. Like that's really important to me as he's able to take what Embiid brings and just completely elevate his own game in that situation. Right? Like we talked about the pitch actions where he gets like this this pass from Embiid while he's on the move. He gets downhill and you just can't stay in front of him, right? He doesn't quite I mean he's an extremely athletic player, right? But he doesn't quite use the vertical athleticism like a like a Ja Morant does, but definitely the horizontal speed is something he brings to the game. But even when Embiid's on the bench, and I think I looked this up a couple days ago, the 76ers are still like plus eight net rating when when Maxie's on the court without him. Like he's, it's not like he's completely uh, uh, dependent on Embiid to go out there and, you know, he's taken a lot more primacy in terms of like creating off the bounce and things like that. Uh, Defensively, I agree with you. Like he can certainly be, be targeted in a negative way because of his size and whatnot. But I think he has a great motor to his game. Like, he definitely tries on defense. He makes some great plays. I think he's had a couple chase down blocks even throughout the season. Like, this is a guy that really gives it his all uh, on that end to try and make up for any sort of woes. And, you know, I hate to do this kind of analysis, Ben, but he also kind of has the Drew factor where it seems like players seem to love playing. Like, this is like a teammate this, of the year. This is, this is Drew Holiday you're speaking of? Yeah, Drew Holiday. Yeah. He, it seems like people like playing with the guy. And I think he might be a candidate for teammate of the year. And uh, that's pretty cool. I think that's an important aspect to have going into a playoff series. So when you take all of that together, uh, Tyrese Maxey is definitely a, a number five for me. There's there's something about Maxey's game that I'm I'm not the primacy of it. I have a hard time understanding or or knowing yet what's going to happen if you throw big playoff defenses at him. Mm-hmm. That's kind of like the question mark on my board was how does he handle more scheming for his game, given his strengths, straight line drive speed, uh, elite shooting, the, the sidestep and the step back three point shooting, get out in transition. Can you take away some of that? I, you know, the fl- that, that crazy floater game that, that he has as he comes down the paint with a little scoop and floater shots. Does that hold up against these kinds of coverages that he's going to see in the playoffs? And Cody, the reason I asked that question, the reason I asked that question is because you alluded to it. In the 412 minutes this season with Joel Embiid on the bench, the 76ers are plus 10 in net rating. They're up to Mm. plus 10. The offensive rating when Maxi's out there without Embiid is 122 right now. And old Tyrese is averaging 32 points per 75 on 60% true shooting without Embiid. Those numbers go way down with Embiid, but without Embiid, the free throw numbers go up, uh, the attempts go up, the three-point volume goes up, the three-point percentage goes up. Those are all like really impressive lone star high primacy signals. And there's part of my brain that expects it to get chipped out a little bit in the playoffs, but I don't have a great feel for it. But it, it is impressive enough that I think he has to be 
uh, in this range. And it sounds like you and I both would, you know, take him here. I mean, I did take him at number five, but you would have as well. Number six, I think, is where it's going to get difficult. So there's one guy. I think people would be mad that he's not going to go number six. I think there's one guy in particular. I'm not going to pick him at number six. Though. I'm not going to pick him at number six. I think we might diverge on this one. This is like a bias towards the kinds of players I really like. This is this is going to be awesome. Are you going to take Are you going to take someone who's like 26th on my board right now? Am I don't I... know. I I don't think so. He'll he'll probably be closer to like 12 for you. I think. Oh, Ben for number six. I'm going Scotty Barnes. He's 12th on my board. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> Actually, incredible. he's 11th. He's 11th. He's 11th. Oh, okay. Okay. I did not know what to do with Scotty Barnes. Mm-hmm. Um. So how about for him? I just ask you a bunch of questions. Okay. He's like playing this like point guard role now. They've moved Schroeder to the bench at this yeah. point in the season. Uh, if you're listening to this from the future and this experiment changed, right now they move Schroeder to the bench. Scotty Barnes is essentially playing point guard. His last like five or ten games, he's having he's going into like that Magic Johnson, like you know, 25, 12, and eight, those kind of raw stat lines. He is a good passer. He's a very good passer. And he can handle the ball for his size. The question, my first question watching this is like. How much primacy would you actually get out of this on a better team? Because the Raptors just don't have other it's not they're like the opposite of the Thunder. There's not it's not like Shea and Jalen Williams and uh who's a team with a ton of other sort of point guards out? Josh Giddy runs offense for them, but it, it's a very different team. And so he's filling that role on that team. And as good as those skills are, it's one of those things where it's like does he have a bunch of B's and B pluses in these areas? And is there an A on offense? I just have bigger questions about the offense. So my first question to you is, how do you feel about him with the primacy and running running this point guard role? I don't necessarily care about the primacy. I don't, Ben. I think it's the secondary passing to me that really stands out to me. He's really quick at making some of these like touch passes. You know, he'll catch it in the air and like kick it to the corner like before landing and things like that. He pushes it in transition. Even if he doesn't have the ball, he'll be sprinting down the court. But if he has it, really great at kind of like making the defense commit to him. Uh, The shooting, Ben, I'm not sure. Like the last two seasons, his wide open three-point percentage was like a shade under 30%. This year, it's a shade under 40%. Do I really believe that? Not sure. I need to see it a little bit more. So I'm not basing all of it on there. But Ben, where he is an A is his motor. Just an (laughs) unbelievable defensive, just frenetic terror out there who's racking up stocks, just jumping passing lanes, contesting people, uh, taking three-point shots, just covering a bunch of different uh, places. He's, you know, one possession, he's playing the Wizard, and he's, he's defending Tyus Jones. Otherwise, other times, he's going down and, like, defending the big man on defense. Maybe one of the most switchable players in the NBA right now. And so when you have a guy that's, like, able to kind of cause havoc that way defensively while being able to, like, literally defend all five positions, like, fairly well... When you combine that with just, like, the passing in general and, like, a shooting ability that seems, like, pretty adequate right now, that's a guy I want to go into a playoff series with. I should say, for the record, after the first trimester of the season here, Scotty Barnes is top 30 in EPM, defensive EPM, RPM, defensive RPM, our box plus minus model. He is statistically playing very, very well. I think he's, you know, if we stop today and put together all-star teams, I think there's a good chance he's an all-star. So in terms of what we've seen in the regular season on the court, I think this spot is totally warranted. But have you looked at his rim protection numbers lately? Or your, the Cody special around here? What happens when the player is on and off the court to the way the team defends the paint and the rim area? Have you looked at them? I haven't. Are they not good? They they are uh, not good. The team is actually better with him when he's on the bench, and that was the, that was the other big category for me to try to figure out sort of the the brown beltness of the Scotty Barnes experience, if you will. Like he is a very good defender. He is a very versatile defender. You watch the game, and he'll make plays at the rim and at the basket. Uh, I, I turned on the game this morning, just watching Toronto and. To your point, he had a beautiful hustle play where he sprinted down the court, uh, rotated to the paint, closed out to the corner, and then held the closeout, meaning he didn't let the guy go by him. He, he recovered, closed out, stopped him. But then Cody, like, would I give his awareness an A 
Are there plays where he gets backdoored a little too often? Are there rotations that he's missing here and there that I don't want for my high-level player? Absolutely. So it's like, this is a good defender. I don't know how great he is defensively. I don't know how great he is offensively. So overall, like, I don't know how far apart you and I are on him. That's still a good player. But I think there's a there's a pretty big difference between, like, you're an A minus in certain areas and a B, and and when you have two or three of those big areas on the court, like the shooting question, the primacy of playmaking question, the actual like defensive, what kind of value are we getting from this kind of player question? To me, it's the difference between you come along and you say Scotty Barnes is a top twenty five player and an all star, and mm, more like Scotty Barnes is a sub all star and a top forty player or something, and that's kind of where I got stuck with him. Well, I think about the Lakers playing the Nuggets last year in the playoffs. And Rui Hachimura was, like, pretty significant in terms of, like, his ability to go and defend Jokic, get Anthony Davis off ball, defend a little bit there. Scotty Barnes is taller than Rui, I think. He's got the same sort of strength. But then you're bringing another layer of just, like, defensive motor, passing ability. I don't know about shooting compared to Rui uh, in terms of, like, what I actually trust. But when you bring in those other skills... I, I don't know. I think that's a guy that, like, really can hang in pretty much any kind of situation that you need him to go into. And the on-off thing you were talking about, the rim protection, there's definitely weird on-off stuff in general. Like, I think his he has a negative, like a negative five-ish net uh, on-off right now, which I don't like to see. Uh, but I didn't want to base my entire analysis around that. So I'm kind of just, I'm go, I'm skewing more towards my eyes as opposed to some of the statistical things I'm seeing. Yeah, no, that's a great point. It's small, although uh, just to reinforce the point, in the last two seasons, if you look at the defensive field goal percentage from second spectrum tracking around the basket, he's in the 54th percentile uh, in changing the expected field goal percentage, and he's in the 56th percentile in volume contested. So I just have, like, he's a guy I like, and I think he's playing really well for what's going on in Toronto, but I also just didn't know where... I'm so glad you took him. Because I, I, I actually moved him around the board repeatedly more than any other player. Uh, and I think, like I said, I had him 11th. Okay, how are you doing? It's still not too late. We could stop now. We don't have to get... You're, you're, you're doing okay? You want to keep gonna going? Say, I'm looking at the time right now. I'm like, oh my God, we, <laughs> we might have to... I think once we get to like 16 or so, there's not going to be a ton to say. I mean, there's always a ton to say, Ben, but... Uh, I, I think, think there's... I think we'll, Yeah, I think there's less to say as we go through, but I think there's a couple more in this same range, and then we probably have, at least on my board, like four or five more guys that will be interesting. Um, So with the next pick, number seven, I am going to... Oh, my God. Why are you doing this to me, Cody? Uh, (laughs) Okay. What's that? This is so tough. It's, It's impossible. It's impossible. No, this is really impossible. I'm flipping a coin here. At number seven, I am going to take part of me wants to like look at the team I'm building and build build around the team draft board. But obviously, we're just taking best players based on a board. Uh, boy, I, th- I think I think I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to do it. Chet Holmgren, let's go. I knew yep. you were going to take him a couple spots above me. Yep. I, oh. I sensed that you were swooping in to get him, and I, I don't think I can let it happen. And uh, we don't have to belabor the point with Chet because we've talked about him this year. We've, we've had videos on him. But here's a Chet story. They played the Minnesota Timberwolves like a month ago, maybe. Really good game. Rudy Gobert had a number of crazy possessions against Chet down the stretch. You can see some of those possessions in the Minnesota Timberwolves video that we did on their defense and Rudy, who looks to me like the front runner for defensive player of the year. And he gave Chet problems and Chet's a rookie. I know he was drafted two years ago, but this is his first year in the NBA. So that makes him technically by definition a rookie. He's still a young player. He's 21 years old. Uh, Rudy gets the better of him on many of these possessions. His size gives him a problem. His strength gives him a problem. Cody, they played the Timberwolves like two or three nights ago, and Chet came out, and he just was cooking. He's like, all right, I'm going to go to the perimeter, and then I'm going to come off a screen and attack a closeout and dunk and finger roll and up fake and shoot, and then double teams coming with a little shoot, a little hip pocket to the corner, uh, three ball, assist. Thank you very much. This guy offensively is so polished for the kind of role he's playing. 
And then you look at the defensive indicators and the defensive performance, and he's already an elite defender and and rim protector. He looks versatile. I'm not going to say he should be in the defensive player of the year conversation, but the statistics do. He's eighth in EPM as we record, fifth in defensive uh, EPM, 93rd percentile in defensive RPM. The guy is an absolute animal out there. Uh, when we talk about the rim protection numbers that we cited earlier, his aren't great on off in terms of stuff like that. But, uh, you know, when he's out there, the Oklahoma City defense is pretty big. And I think he's a massive key to Oklahoma City taking a step forward this season because of that defensive presence. I, I just think he's a really, really good player who's only going to get better. I could have taken him now or a couple spots later, but it's almost like when you think about playoff matchups, I, I'm not sure the rookiness or the youthfulness of Chet Holmgren actually presents many warts because when I see stuff like I saw in Minnesota the other night or against Minnesota the other night, that just makes me think this guy is built for war. And even in his first playoff run, I mean, he's just so skilled. I'm, I'm not sure that we're going to see that typical rookie drop that we normally see. And he's not one of these big men that's just only relying on shooting from the perimeter. He's got some ball skills, Ben. Like he feel he looks really nimble when he's attacking off the bounce, and it's it's impressive what he's able to string together when he's going to the basket that way. Um, I had him down a couple more spots. I had him nine on my list. And that was honestly a rookie tax. Like if I was being objective about it, I probably would have actually had him around this area. But like I just I don't know. I never bank on rookies as much. But everything that I've seen is just like it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And I know we've talked about it in terms of I think when Kyle was on, we compared him and Wembenyama, and just like the the situations that they're in and you can't really imagine a better situation for Chet to be on like surrounded by all these other these ball handlers and the system that lets him do these funky things on offense so I think that's cool but again the fact that he's able to fit into this team build is more of a compliment to him as a player than saying like oh this is the only kind of if you you can't just be like oh the Thunder is the only kind of team you could fit next to it's a weird enough team that if you do that I can see you go into a bunch of other kinds of team builds I want to clarify a point um, earlier when I said the rim protection numbers, I was referring to that on off change in the team's defense when Chet is on the court because Cody and I were just talking about that. But if you look at his second spectrum tracking, he's in the 97th percentile in shots contested at the basket and the 94th percentile in changing the field goal percentage of those shots. So, I mean, your eyes are not deceiving you. The dude is fantastic defensively. I was right there with you on the rookie tax. I bumped him up a spot or two just because I saw him go back against Gobert in round two and be so much more effective in a blowout win the other night. So, okay, now I think there's a couple the impossible decisions. There's probably like two or three impossible decisions coming up. No one's upset at all about any of these choices, Cody. What are you going to do at number seven, number eight? Number eight, what are you going to do? Okay, here i got to be honest with you. There's a guy that I have at number seven. And I'm not going to take him because I want you to take him. I no, don't, I don't. This I don't is horrible. Take this guy. I don't want to take this guy. I don't. We can get into it when he's picked at some point, but I don't want to take him. So I'm going to go down to my next pick. What's going I'm gonna on? Go, I'm going to go to number eight, which is good because we're on the number eight pick. Why don't you just take your number seven? Because I I think I'm wrong. I, the only reason I have him that high is because I thought I'd want to take him so that people didn't get mad at me, but I, I just can't do it. I okay. can't do it this high. This is amazing. So for number eight, Ben, I'm gonna take Lamelo Ball. This is this is this is this is amazing. I'm gonna take Lamelo Ball. Yeah, this is amazing. That's a great pick, Cody. I approve of that pick. Where where'd you have him? I had him eighth on my board. <laughs> no way. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Lamelo, he's a huge point guard, Ben. Like he is an enormous individual, and you combine that with him very solidly being like a plus forty percent wide open three point shooter. Like he is just deadly, and he can pull up. Like he, he easily pulls the touch. up. The touch, the touch. It, it's he, crazy. Yeah. yeah, the touch, the skill. Keep going. On top of all that, the passing. I, maybe the most audacious passer in the NBA. Like classic. If you were in the like eighties, it'd be like Magic Johnson and the Mellow Ball just out there to entertain. Like the no looks he does. The like wrap around. Like crazy cuffing the ball and throwing it cross court. He's just so much fun to watch, and it feels like, you know, last season, last couple seasons, his finishing ability was something that always held me back. It feels like it's better 
this year he seems like he's more patient it, and better at getting to the rim and finishing when he gets there. It jumps statistically. I was going to yeah. say that. Yeah, it's like a five or seven point jump statistically. So your, your eyes are not deceiving you there. So he's just across the board offensively, it seems more polished. Um, did I say defensively or offensively? You said, said offensively. Yeah. Okay, I meant offensively. More polished. It's just a tough team he's on right now in general. Like, I would like to see him on a better team. I would like to see, like, if you gave him the keys to, like, the Indiana Pacers offense, like, how much different would it look with his skill set? And so I think he's getting hurt a little bit from being on a really bad team because I could see, like, a theoretical world where he's actually, like, in the top four of this draft right now because I think he's just an immensely talented uh, offensive player. I own a lot of LaMelo stock. Most people don't know that. I've been collecting it for a while. I continue to collect more every season. Uh, the guy is 22 years old. 22 years and 128 days as of recording this. I just think he's special. Um, his offense, he can be a primary guy and be pretty effective. I think everything he does offensively works as the secondary guy, the tertiary guy. I think he could play in Golden State. I think he could play le- next to Luka Doncic in Dallas. I think he could be the defensive weak point in Orlando. But that's the other thing, Cody. He's so big. He's so quick. He's so athletic. He has such a creative, wild, uh, fast twitch basketball brain that even with all his defensive problems, I think in a different situation with the right coaching, part of the stock I'm buying is that I see potential for LaMelo Ball to not be one of these massively leaky, bleeding defenders in a playoff environment. It's almost counterintuitive. Like you're like, you see a guy on a poor team and his defensive indicators are poor and his defensive possessions are poor. But I actually think if you ramp that up and you give him the time, he's only 22 and he's missed time with injury before, uh, I think he's getting close to being ready to not be such a huge negative on defense. So not only do I have LaMelo stock, but I, I really would like to start the free LaMelo campaign right now in public. I'm surprised that I, when you were talking about picking players I wanted to pick, I was wondering if you were talking about LaMelo or now the next player that I must be forced to pick. Yeah, uh, I think it's going to be the guy that you're, you're forced to pick. Who at number nine... Um, and he's tough to place. He's tough to place. I was thinking about taking him instead of Chet last time. I changed my mind at the last second because of that Minnesota game that I mentioned, but I think it's time for Zion Williamson. Mm -hmm. Uh, Zion Williamson, it's been, it's been beaten to death by all angles of basketball media. So we don't need to do it. He's just not in the right condition. He's just not in the right shape. You can see it on his pop around the basket. That is everything in the sense that Zion is a mutant. He has a superpower. He is a nuclear bomb going to the rim. He's a video game. You just press the button and he goes in and he runs through everyone and he finishes. And uh, I mean, his ability to get there and finish fairly well is like at an all-time level. And it's been at an all-time level. But when you take away the conditioning like you have this year, you get a dip. So you get like 99th percentile in frequency still, but 51st percentile in drive percentage. His rim field goal percentage overall is still pretty good, but I think it's shaving stuff off his game. I think the lack of conditioning may be hurting a little of his off-ball movement and explosiveness. Although I also don't think the Pelicans are using him off-ball very well right now. I kind of feel like the Pelicans offense is a, is a little scattered. It's in a little disarray. It's not as cohesive as it could be. So that's why I'm not sure what to do with him because he's clearly not like top 10, top 15 player, build an unstoppable offense around his superpower when he's in this condition. But he's also still pretty good. And the thing I want to call out is the playmaking. That has improved. His passing and his passing reads has have improved. Uh, he can basically still play that like point Zion, generate stuff, get downhill, and then make really nice decisions with the ball. Not an elite passer, but a clear jump for me in that category. So you add all that up, then you get to the defensive side, which is another question mark. I, I just don't know what to do with him. I, I, can't, I feel like I can't have him very high right now based on how he's playing, but I also feel like there's only so far down you want to go before you're like, wait a second, if I throw Zion on the court, and I have good players next to him, and I have the right scheme, he's adding a ton of value in a playoff series because he's a nightmare still. And he almost has, like, he gets some of his drives in, like, some of these maxi types of possessions where when he does get downhill and then catches a pass, he's just such a bear to stop, right? Like, it's not necessarily just give him the ball and have him attack, 
but maybe he curls around a wide screen, you give him the pass, and it's just like, oh my god, what do we do about this guy? And when you add in like the passing ability, the improved passing that he has, you just have the the recipe for a really strong offensive player. But you know, we talked about him in context when we were saying the best rim finishers of all time. Like he was we we dabbled with putting him up there with like Giannis and LeBron and Shaq, right? Like some of his numbers from a couple of years ago are like literally right there, if not better than anything we've ever seen before. But when you shave that down and at the same time shave off some of the defensive uh, abilities that he has, I just don't know what you have with him. And so this is a guy that like, you know, you think about peak Zion, it's obviously a guy you want to have this high, but it's also somebody I didn't necessarily want to bank on. So thank you so much for picking him. I wanted to have this conversation but I didn't necessarily want to be the one that had it. Okay. Uh, it goes back to you at number 10. Still not easy. Who, who are you going to take now? I think for me, for me, I should say we're about to go into kind of a new tier, mm-hmm. uh, if you will, of players. So there's, now there's a new group coming up that makes it all the more difficult again. I've stalled enough for you. Who are you taking? I think this might be bias time. Um, he's number 10. I'm not draft board. I just, I just have to do it, Ben. I'm doing Franz Wagner. I knew you're, I knew you're gonna do that. I knew you're gonna do that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Franz. I think, just, I think, I think he's the best Orlando player. I don't, I, I don't necessarily think it's that close either, which is interesting because if you look at like the raw box score, uh, Ben Caro's like, you know, you, you stack up like the key things and it looks like he's producing a little bit more, but I think the the offense and defense that Wagner brings, especially with like attacking the basket. It's, it's, it's actually kind of an interesting, subtle thing here, because I think Boncaro stands out in terms of like drawing free throw attempts and things like that. But if you look a little bit more into like the interesting on off rim frequency type numbers, the magic just attack the basket more when Wagner's on the court versus Boncaro being on the court. And it's, like, really not close in that sense. Like, the Magic are one of the best rim frequency types of teams in the league. And when Franz is on without uh, Bancaro, it's, like, balloons up. I think it's up to, like, 40% rim frequency, which, like, you compare it to the rest of the league. It's just absurd. Like, 40% 40 of their shots come at the rim. Yeah. Yeah. Basically that. And even if you look at, like, the free throw attempts from the team, I think they even get more free throw attempts as a team when he's on without Bancaro. So even though the shooting is just, like, I can't explain the shooting this year. Like... Like, Bancaro is shooting, like, 10 percentage points better from three than Franz, which is very strange because I think Franz the last couple seasons has been, like, a solid enough wide-open three-point shooter and it's just completely lost him right now, even though he's maybe, like, an 85% free-throw shooter. So I'm not really sure what's going on with the, the shooting of it all, but I'm really impressed with his driving ability. I'm really impass- impressed with his passing when he's driving, and he's just a mammoth of a wing bend. He is just a very long, athletic, and strong individual that even if, like, the straight-line speed isn't necessarily, like, a John Morant, he's just kind of, like, eloping a couple of steps, and all of a sudden he's just at the rim, all right? And, you know, he has some strength where he can kind of back somebody down when he's closer to the rim. Um, man, I just don't see too many weaknesses that this guy has uh, on a team. Okay, let me give you some numbers. Um, one of these players takes 13 drives every 36 minutes and finishes those drives at 57% true shooting. Okay. 13 and 57. Yep. The, uh, the other player takes 14 drives every 36 minutes and finishes at 50%. Hmm. So player one is 13, 57%. Player two is 14 and 50%. Who are those two players? They play for the Magic. Is it, is it Wagner and Moncaro? And which one is the one who's better statistically at finishing? I think it's that's probably Franz. It's Franz Wagner. And this is the weird thing to me. If I had a if I had a theory about why we're seeing those on off numbers with the magic, it's I think they run too much offense through Boncaro and Boncaro's decision making and kind of uh, speed at which he does stuff with the ball is a lot of isolation and back down and let me let me run a pick and roll with Boncaro, but then I'm gonna restart and dribble it because I don't really know how to attack it. There's too much of that. Now I don't necessarily blame them because they don't really have like a number one offensive player is a great defensive team with a, with a bunch of like number threes and number fours on offense. 
But that's also why I love Franz in this position because he's so good at attacking closeouts. He's sh- so good at, uh, you know, relatively good at catch and shoot three point shooting. Uh, he can play make with the ball, extra passing, decision making. He's pretty quick. He's big, so you throw in little things like cuts and offensive rebounds and stuff. He's just a great complementary piece who I think every year moves closer to becoming a high level playoff performer on a good team. But none of these guys are like run the championship offense through him um, and that's what makes it so interesting but Franz of course also such a stout defender with his size and his length so to me he's the best magic player Paolo is just so interesting in that when I think of his superpower it's not outside shooting it's not mid-range shooting he's a pretty good passer mm-hmm. for what he brings but you know I wouldn't want him dancing with the ball a lot I think there's a lot of poor decisions there relative to high level playoff basketball And even defensively, I love his size and I love what he's able to bring defensively. But if you look at his uh, rim protection numbers, for example, even though he's huge at like 6'10", it's they're not like they're not great. So like I think he's a pretty good defender. Let's put it that way. So, yeah, I think Franz is the best magic player. And um, oh, sorry, I, I totally forgot to finish my point about Boncaro's superpower. His drives feel like his superpower. Like when he has space, he has that sort of like Giannis light. I'm huge and mobile and I can get there. And yet the numbers, uh, they're a little better this year. But even going back to last year, like I want better rim finishing numbers from him, given that superpower. And it's and it's not quite there yet. Yeah. And I think, you know, I want to actually give a little bit more context for the rim finishing or the rim percentage numbers. So right now, this is a couple days ago, the Magic had the highest rim frequency, so the percentage of shots they take at the rim. It was the highest in the league at 37%. The Lakers were second at the time at 33.5%. So it's like quite a big gap. And I know you might be like, or somebody can make the comments like, oh, it's because they're not like great shooters or whatever else. But I do like the the fact that a team can like get to the rim. And I think that's something that would hold fairly well um, in, a, in a playoff situation. Just because, you know, when you have so much size getting to the basket, it's not necessarily like the relying on like jitterbug guards to get to the paint, but their size and ability to use their strength getting into the paint is just... I don't know how many teams would be able to hold up against that. I don't think there's too many teams that have the size that could go against that. So Franz is kind of the, the leader in that ability. At number 11, Cody, mm-hmm. uh, I narrowed it down to, I'm not saying there aren't other players to consider here, but really looking at like Mobley and Wemby, Evan Mobley and Victor Wembenyama, mm-hmm. and these archetypes of switchy, rangy, versatile, shot-blocking big men who maybe can't shoot the basketball into the hoop cylinder area with the accuracy and frequency that we would all like. And uh, I do think there is a bit of a rookie tax to pay, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to take Victor Wembanyama at number 11 because I think defensively he still messes you up that badly. I think in many ways you could argue – that in a playoff series, he's going to be able to mess things up more than Evan Mobley. And I'm not sure if Mobley's experience offensively, I'm not sure if it gets that back. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a really weird place with, with Evan right now. He's As of recording this, he's injured. He's out for a little while. But he also didn't have a great start to the season. Uh, and you, of course, want that like year four. You want to continue to see the upward trend. Didn't feel like I got that in the first 30 games. So I'm, I'm going to zig again. I'm going to go f- kind of future-facing, place my bet that way. I, I just think Wembenyama's defense is I, – he's one of the best defenders in the league. It was ridiculous. This is our first, like, huge gap. And that's because I didn't know what to do with Wemby. I just straight up didn't know how to handle him in this situation because the, the Spurs situation he's in is just – it's so dire, Ben. Like, it's, it's so dire. It's not. Like, it's nonsense. You can't take any of that at face value. Like, like I know. the okay. Make make your point, and I'm gonna. Uh, I'm, then I'm gonna uh, pull a number to that, kind of summarize the entire Spurs situation. That's my point. I like didn't know what to make of any of it. Right when you look at the way that Chet is being able to to grow and blossom in this Thunder situation, then you see you know Jeremy Sohan playing point guard for the Spurs, <laughs> and Trey Jones isn't getting the the run that he should be in those Wemby lineups. I didn't know what to make of it, so I, I probably bumped him down lower than he deserved to be. Okay, so this is the number. 
in 274 minutes with Trey Jones and Victor Wembanyama on the court, the Spurs, who as of recording this, are like, what, 4-24? and 24? What is their actual record? We, should, we have an internet. We should probably be able to access this so it's chronicled in time if you're listening in the future. They're 4-25. and 25. The Spurs are 4-25, and 25, okay? They have, according to Basketball Reference, a minus 11 SRS. Basketball Reference says you're the worst team in the league. You're on pace to win, like, 15 games, maybe less. You're terrible. When Wemby and Trey Jones play, that is the point guard, that is the Spurs using an actual point guard instead of Jeremy Sohan experimenting as a point guard, the Spurs are plus four in those minutes. They are outscoring their opponents by four points per 100 in those minutes. And I am not saying that if they just played a heavy diet of Trey and Victor Wembanyama, that they'd be a 44-win team, but they would be a lot better than this just with Trey Jones getting a ton of minutes so Wemby could have a point guard. And then you can extrapolate out from there. Like, what if you had slightly better shooting? What if you had slightly other better defenders next to him? I mean, it is really a sort of Russian Siberia situation compared to the uh, bougie metropolitanism of Paris, Oklahoma City that Chet Holmgren, Chet Holmgren's out in the cafes with croissants, wisping his mustache in between his, his index finger and his thumb thinking, boy, I'm glad I don't have to be in that situation in San Antonio. God, that was beautiful, Ben. That was beautiful. I think, I think Wemmed Yama's leading the league in blocks too. Um, how, how do you feel about him defending in space? How how does that look to you? Do you have any thoughts uh, it's, on it's, that? I mean, it's it's coming along. You know, it's something that instinctually, with those hips and his range and his length, I think has always been sort of preternatural. But the NBA is faster. The players are more skilled. The players are bigger. So it's not something that I think is at the elite level that we'll see it at in the future. So yeah, I would not put him in the defensive player of the year conversation, but. And and the weird thing is Mobley was like, you could make the argument that Mobley still was playing really, really good defense. Mm-hmm. I'm doing a lot of zigging and zagging right now, Cody. I had Mobley ahead, and I just feel like if I get to a playoffs, maybe I've talked myself out of this. Can I talk myself out of a pick? Can I take Mobley instead? Can I switch it? Wait, is that what you want to do? You want I don't to- know. I don't know. I, this is, I came down to these two players, and my brain was orienting toward Wembenyama as like a destructive force in a postseason environment. And I feel like I trust that a little bit more. It's almost like I threw the offense out the window because I'm so frustrated with Mobley's offense Mm -hmm. right now. And then that left me with who would I rather have defensively? And I kind of feel like Wemby's there. But I think think if we started the tournament tomorrow and I had to pay a rookie tax and offense is an actual thing, uh, would Wembenyama be able to not take every open... 19 footer every 19 footer every time he touches the ball would he not be able to do that i'm changing my mind i'm gonna go i'm gonna go with mobley everything i said applies i'm gonna go with mobley oh wow am i allowed to do that can i send the pick back to the to the kitchen yeah take evan mobley i love yeah there you go do you think because i think we we like taxation here apparently i think we bring up taxes a lot like start calling us the thomas payne podcast at some point here um <laughs> evan Mo- like would you was would he you was say- thomas Paine big into taxation what wasn't he wasn't that like representation no taxation was that not the right historical figure i That'd don't be know really embarrassing i don't teach yeah. history i'm sorry everyone um do you think there's any like real improvement from last season to this season from what you saw with evan Mobley? no i don't know that's why i'm so frustrated i, I every think time i taxing him. yeah i think yes but i because of that <laughs> But I'm not sure. I I think the Wemby conversation is perfect, and I just walked through it, and everyone got to see my emotional angst in in real time out loud. It was was like a cross between a basketball therapy session and one of those free writing exercises you do in, like, College 101. Um, I had just... I'm frustrated with Mobley's offense, Mm -hmm. and I think at the same time, you could argue he's, I mean, statistically and based on what you see, he's still been fantastic defensively. Yes. When you, I think the right tax to apply here is the rookie tax to Wemby, particularly on offense with his shot selection and his shot accuracy. And Mobley's probably at this point, you think like, man, I wish Mobley were stronger. I wish he were more physically strong. Wemby's behind him. So I think based on all that, uh, I, I, I think Mobley's the, the better pick here. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think Mobley looked solid 
in the playoffs defensively. It's like we've seen him be like, oh, you're a functional defensive player here. But yeah, the offense is it is it's frustrating seeing that. Um, you'll probably be able to take Wembenyama because I'm not going to take him next, Ben. I'm, I'm going to take somebody. It feels what if like I don't I'd... take him? What if I don't take him next? Wow. Then we just have like a, a free Wembenyama discussion section where when we pick him, it's just like we can just move on. It feels like I'm picking this guy too early, but I also feel like we're all collectively down on him maybe a little too much. Um, I'm taking Evan's teammate. I'm going uh, Darius Garland at number 12. I'm taking Darius Garland. Okay. Okay. Uh just what injuries this year have hit him and the timing of the injuries and the shot. He's an unbelievable shooter, but the open shooting numbers have cratered or something is what talk me through the, where you're at. So like last season shot 44% on wide open threes. It's a great number. That's excellent. It's down to about 37% this season, right? That's a seven percentage point drop off. It's pretty significant, especially with somebody that's not bringing much to the table defensively. That's banking a lot on his shooting ability and stuff like that. But when I watch him, I don't necessarily know if anything looks significantly different in terms of what I saw last year. Like, he's still, like, a quick little uh, driver. He still makes great passing reads, still great at manipulating the defense and making, you know, kick-out passes or lay-down passes to his big men. Uh, the Cavaliers just have a weird vibe, and I'm not necessarily sure what's going on, and I don't know who to point the finger at in any situation. But I think Garland basically looks about the same from what I've seen. And that's a quick, great passing point guard who's an excellent shooter uh, and definitely a negative on defense. And in terms of, like, the context of those other point guards that can be described that same way that we took earlier, probably just a little bit of a rung down below them, and that's where we are right now. Yep, that's exactly what I feel. And like I said, it's counterintuitive, but Garland, I struggle. The physicality of the playoffs and the size of the playoffs, I, I feel like has been a little bit of a struggle for him in the last couple seasons, despite the incredible playmaking talent, vision, hand-eye coordination, shooting talent, j- jitteriness to his you know ball handling, pogo stick game, I love all that. But uh, yeah, I think he's a little behind the other point guards that we we talked about and drafted earlier in the show. With my next pick, I'm going to take Victor Wembanyama. Cody, who would you like to <laughs> who would you like to take with the number 14 pick? All right, you don't you don't want to do like a secondary section. There's nothing else you want to say. No, but he, I I feel like we've now cleared this sort of tier of players I needed to get rid of, and um, we are now in the glut of how to fill out the last like five or six. What's going to be ten picks because you pick as well, but um, it's yeah, it's a, it's a new task here. It's a, it's a pretty. You could go in any direction. I think. W- yeah. What are you going to do? This is, I think this is where it actually gets the toughest, right? Because when I was looking at, like, the top 10 guys are actually the guys I had in the top 10. Not necessarily in the same order, but the fact that it was those top 10 guys. I'm like, all right, we're on the same page. But I think there's a chance we could diverge quite a bit in some of these picks. Um, I'm going to take Jalen Williams, the point guard from OKC. Oh, my God. Jalen Williams was next on my board. He was going to be my pick. Oh, t- t- why were you, why were you gonna? Since you were stolen from being able to talk about Wemby Yama in your last pick, uh, tell me why you were gonna I, pick Jalen. I got to talk about Wemby plenty. No, I think Jalen Williams is just this. We were already seeing him on a on a high level team, a team that's uh, gonna have a good seed, be in the playoffs, maybe advance a round or two in the playoffs, and he just uh, he just does a lot of stuff. You know, he can play point guard. He's a good passer. He can get downhill. He can drive. He's got good touch. He's got good feel. I don't think he's a negative defender. Um, just love that kind of player in this position on the board where we're talking about you, you got to be sort of a high level, high role player, sub all star y kind of guy. You got to have those connective tissue skills. And I think Jalen Williams is that kind of player right now. I think people talk about sneaky athleticism. He has sneaky length. Like he's oh, yeah. the kind of guy the wing, that like, the he drives span. and all of a sudden he's just like dunking the ball. I'm like, I didn't know you had like that much of a takeoff here. I didn't know you're yeah. able to get up there. But you combine that with just like the herky jerky, weird, like almost Manu Ginobili type of like, I'm kind of moving this direction, but my body's going this way and the ball's over here. And, he, you know, just a great player that fits in. Like we if he can coexist with Shea, you can coexist with pretty much any kind of like ball dominant sort of player. And the shooting ability, and I think that probably dropped off a little bit from last year. I don't think his shooting numbers are quite as good, so I'm not sure where to, like, dial that in exactly. But just, you know, across the board, a guy that doesn't really have that many weaknesses and brings something to the table definitely on offense. 
<sighs> okay, so I now I have to pick another basketball player from the NBA. Is that what you're oh, saying? We're gonna have like ten more players to pick. Ah, uh, boy. See, I think this is the part of the show where wait. See, top top fifteen under twenty five doesn't have the same ring. No. And we can't do top 15 under 15 because no one knows who those players are. Um, so <laughs> Chip Jones does. I, yeah, yeah, Chip, Chip, Chip Jones does. Chip Jones probably has a top 100 board of uh, Chip Jones does our, our draft stuff and does a lot of draft stuff um, on Twitter and things like that and has and is written, written about drafts and made videos about drafts. And, and this is just me stalling. Hey, Chip, if you're listening, thanks for helping me stall on this answer. Uh I am going to take Emmanuel quickly. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. I'm going to take Emmanuel quickly. I just think he's a really good basketball player. Um, I think that if he were in a different situation, we might see... Uh, well, on one hand, the question is, like, would you see his actual raw offensive numbers be much better that would make him feel like a much better player? Uh, we've talked about his defense before. He's obviously a very good guard defender. I like that element from him. So you're not giving up something defensively at the guard position, but he's a guy who consistently has really good plus minus indicators. He's a good, but not great outside shooter. He's a pretty good passer. I just think, I just think when, you know, think about what you just said about Jalen Williams. I think this applies to quickly on good playoff teams. I think he fits on a lot of good playoff teams. I do wonder what would happen if he had more primacy, but um, I, th- I just think I just think he's a good player. I think he's a good... We, let's go back to a term that neither you and I like, but I think conveys this point. I just think he's a winning player, Cody. Cody, he just makes winning, he just makes winning basketball plays. Just makes the good plays. Friend of the show, Mark Schindler, just, just wrote a piece about Emmanuel Quickly's play with the Knicks talking about he's how he's probably one of the three or four best players on the Knicks period this season and it's kind of you know there's some rotation stuff that's kind of hurting him that way but when we look at his you know the size of the guard position his shooting ability isn't taking anything off from on defense I, I think it's a very fair pick to have here yeah um if you uh look at his numbers without Jalen Brunson it's 27 points per 75 61 percent true shooting gets to the basket more now the Knicks aren't like killing people they're they have a plus two net rating in those situations so I like I said I I don't really have a great feel for what his primacy would look like in those situations does he you know he creates a ton more with the ball his passing production and efficiency spikes when Brunson goes off the court but here's the other cool thing about quickly and the whole shtick about being a winning player Despite being a similar like guard, when he plays with Brunson, Cody, in small sample alert, but in the first third of the season, in 360 minutes, the Knicks are plus 15 per 100 possessions with Quickly and Brunson on the floor with a 126 offensive rating. And like I said, this has just been consistent. When he goes in, when he goes in the game, good things seem to happen in New York. And, and I really feel like he translates to a lot of good positions and places. I love that. I'm, I'm going to move this along. I think we can we can be snappier with these because people are going to start getting angry with some guys that are going to drop off. So I think the quicker Wait, we go through just, them, just get, get through them real quick. Yep. And they won't notice. I think that's a great strategy. I don't know if I'm picking this guy too high. Uh, I'm a huge fan of him though, and I don't necessarily know if I love the context he's in. But uh, I'm going to go Trey Murphy the third for sixteen. Well, I'm going to give you the floor because I did not know what to do with him. He's definitely a candidate here for me. And my biggest question with Trey is just like, is he ready to put it all together? Uh, the Memphis game the other night, I thought the intensity got to him. That's still, I still feel like he needs the reps. So are we cheating? Like if we start the playoffs today, is he not there? But if we start in two months, is he there because he hasn't had the reps from the injury? C- Cody, what, what makes you take him? So I think it's pretty clear now he's a fantastic shooter. Right? There's no question about it. He is just a knockdown three-point shooter. And he's also huge. Like He is just long. He's athletic. Uh, on ball, I still have a lot of questions about him. And I think this is where I'm being a little bit more charitable towards him, is when I see them playing their New Orleans offense when he's on the court. There's a lot of times where I'm like, I wonder if we could give him a little bit more responsibility. 
Like, what would happen if Ingram wasn't handling here? What would happen if Zion wasn't creating? Or what would happen if C.J. McCollum wasn't the, the tertiary in this sort of lineup, right? And so I'd almost like to see him in a different sort of offense where I don't, I don't necessarily think he's built to be a primary type of creator, but it's a guy... You know, these are the kinds of guys that, like, playoff teams need to thrive. Somebody that's going to knock down threes. Somebody that's going to be a good defensive player just because of his length and his size. Uh, I don't think he's, like, an all-D candidate type of guy right now, but he's definitely not going to be attacked on defense. Um, I I just think that he could do a little bit more with some more responsibility. The finishing numbers are fantastic. Like, he's a guy that when he gets into the paint, he's able to score pretty well. Again, not a lot of that is off the bounce from himself. Like, he's not self-creating a lot of those. But he's really not given a lot of those chances right now with the Pelicans. And nerdiness here for a second, the on-off numbers are fantastic. And they've pretty much always been fantastic for him. So, this is just a... Man, I guess we're now we're just doing it, Ben. He's just a winning player, man. Trey Murphy the is just a winning player. I, I See, I wonder if he has the passing or playmaking chops to take on more yeah that, and that's the thing he's like the ultimate three and d player who i'm excited about his ability to expand and get a little bit better on ball but i don't know right now if that changes too much or anything like that um can i go crazy with my next pick please i like your idea of just because to me at least cody you tell me what you think we've gone through the like differentiable parts of the exercise Mm -hmm. now we're i'm looking at like 15 players i have no idea what order to put them in i could probably pick you know 10 or 15 guys here and i wouldn't upset myself um so i think we should get out of here as quickly as possible because when people look back and they're like this guy was 16th and this other guy wasn't even picked it's like yeah i i literally have them on my board and i'm deciding uh, between the two of them, because that's how close the players get together. We really should end this at 15 players, but we'll enter. We'll entertain people for a few minutes. I want to take Jalen Suggs. Yes. Oh my I'm God. You it. did it. I did, did it. it. I did it. Jalen Suggs is so good defensively. I just get those Alex Caruso, Lonzo ball, 2021 fall vibes. He's first in the NBA as a guard in defensive EPM after 30 games this year. It's just, I get, Cody, I get like 1997 Jason Kidd vibes. You know what I mean? Not the same passer, maybe not the same offensive player, but he can pass, he can push and pace, and then defensively, he's just a, he's just a hound. He's just nasty defensively. We're going to circle back to him later in the year with a ton more on that when we get to the Thinkies, the all-defensive, the Thinking Basketball Defensive Awards that we do every year at the end of the season. We'll talk about that in detail, but I just think it's good enough here where I, if I'm splitting hairs with the other guys on my board, I want to, I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to go Suggs now. I'm just mad that I didn't take him. This is, this is actually hurting me. This is, this was actually all done to just one up you. I needed to calculate beforehand. Uh, When was Cody going to take Jalen Suggs and then get in there one pick earlier. He's also a sneaky, good shooter. Like I think he's a better shooter than people give him credit. Good, good might be a little too, uh, uh, rosy of a term, right? But he's like, He's like not a terrible shooter. He's shooting like 38% from three, isn't he? He is uh, in the last three seasons, 27% on his wide open threes, which is in the seventh percentile. But this season, I think we've finally seen some improvement on his three point shot, which is what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah. I don't know 30, how much. 37% to start the year. So I I really believe in motor. I think motor is just an, an under like analyzed aspect of the game and that's something you just can't take away from somebody when it gets to the playoffs like there's nothing you can do as a team to make somebody not play with the intensity that they play with and Suggs just has intensity in spades he's just all he's just a absolute cannonball on defense he crashes the glass uh with just like reckless abandon he had this great chase down block against Tobias Harris yesterday he's just kind of everywhere and there's nothing that you can scheme for to do about an energy guy I think this is a great time to remind everyone before we spam out these last few picks that in the postseason, the game is a little faster. It's a little more physical. All the scheming, the attention to detail makes stuff a little sharper. The gaps close a little faster. And on offense and defense, the one thing you just can't fake is that athleticism, that motor, that strength, that intensity. It's all magnified. And that's something that's on my mind as I pick these players. And that's why I think Suggs is just like a legit dog on defense. He's just he's just that good defensively. Okay. I'm so happy you went that way. I'm Eight, so happy. 18th pick, where are you going to go? Um, oh, man. 
I'm going to go Jaron Jackson Jr. here. I'm going to go Jaron. All right, I have a confession. Yep. <sighs> this is a disaster. Okay. This is an absolute disaster. How is uh, it? Oh. Yeah, I, 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 I forgot to pick two players on my draft board. I got too oh. excited. Oh, no. Yeah, Jaron Jackson oh. Jr. was one of them. Oh, no. How far back were you going to pick him? Oh, it's way back. Oh. It, it's way back. <laughs> uh, so it's, before, it's, probably... it's, it's before Evan Mobley. Oh, my God. You were going to yeah. pick him that early. Yep. I was going to. I think I want JJJ over Evan Mobley right now. Yep. Okay. Wow. Yep. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily know if I would do that because I know the scoring game from Jaron seems to be a little bit more developed, but in terms of passing Mobley seems leaps and bounds better of a passer than Jaron. Oh yeah. And yeah, yes. J- J- <laughs> yes. What did I say earlier? Jaron Jackson couldn't hit an open man in a phone booth. <laughs> yeah. Jaron's Jaron's ultimate weakness is passing. Yeah. You give me the black lung pop. Yeah. Um, Wait a second. So what are we doing? Are we are we keeping the integrity of the list? Or we we can't go back and fix this. This is ridiculous. Wait. Okay. So what? I think I would. I think. Okay. I actually, Cody, you're just gonna laugh so hard. I actually wasn't gonna take Jaron Jackson 11th. I took Mobley 11th. Yep. I was gonna take someone else. I told you I skipped two players. If you're wondering why I skipped two players, it's because this year I am also keeping track of the order of the picks and who picks. And we started picking similar players. Like you were like, this guy's 11th on my board. And I was like, he's 11th on my board. And uh, I just completely didn't notice that I forgot to pick these two. I, I just got so I just got so excited to pick Suggs. I'm That's so all fascinated that happened. by this. I think, I think the vibes of it all has to be immortalized in the list. So I kind of think Jaren. Uh, this, is, this is just wild. He probably needs I, to be 18th. Did you forget these two players? Like, Jaron, I can understand you thinking, oh, he's slumping to start the season. But there's another player that I would have picked. I w- this was going to be my 11th pick, and I completely forgot to pick him. Does that player play for a Texas team? Oh, yeah. He plays for a Texas team. Absolutely. Yep, yep. He was. Yeah. Uh, I had him and So he and, and Jaron were 15 and 16 on my board. Okay. Yeah. He and Jaron were right next to each other on my board. They were 9 and 10. Do you want to just jump ahead and... T- talk about him then uh I, I mean we've talked about him a ton i'm gonna i'm gonna take alper and shengen yep. uh like 10 picks too late this is this is just <laughs> this is the vibes of this oh my goodness See, this, is, this is what's brilliant about it right no this is not brilliant it's because we have our list that we just picked right now mm-hmm. but we can yeah. go back and say like oh you can't be angry because that's not actually our list. Like, if no, you go back, they're gonna is... post. They're gonna post this list somewhere, and then in like two years, we're gonna go back and we're gonna be like, "What was the snapshot? Where? How were people feeling about these players at that time?" And it's gonna be like Alpi Shengun at nineteen. No, 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 no. Shengun has made a big stride defensively, and that's critical because you can still say he's not a great defender. You can still say it might be a weak spot when you get to the playoffs and all this stuff. But that jump from being like drowning underwater defensively to being passable defensively and frankly statistically and in certain settings he's been good you know what I mean like if you look at some of the numbers or if you look at some of the plays he's able to use his length some of his strength um, and just play solid defense in that system that they have in Houston around him you combine that with the offensive talent and I think we are talking about a very good offensive player already I just think he needs to be ahead of uh, I was just scanning the board. I think you could take Garland over him. I think he's got to be in that range, though. Okay. He's got to be in like that top 13-ish, that like group around 10, 11, 12, 13. That's where I had him mapped out and just completely forgot that we hadn't picked Jaron Jackson Jr. and Alperin Shengun. And, uh, and, and we were going to have a huge disagreement because apparently you have him lower and we just totally forgot to pick him. Just a couple of spots, 15 and 16. I think that's that, that's fair, I think. I don't know. I think the uh, Shangun is a great offensive player, but the shooting, he still is very hesitant to shoot those threes, and for good reason. He's he not... doesn't need to shoot threes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did something that I like about him, uh, I don't know if anyone else like back scratches on his dunks as much as he does. Like He loves to really bring it back before he, he throws it down. That's an un- underappreciated art. That I that I like. All right, so Back where scratching. would you if you took yeah. those two, where would you slot them in then? Like, we would um, just put them in and push everyone else down. Yeah, I would have Shen Gun. I would have taken him if I didn't take him eleventh. I would have taken him thirteenth. 
Okay. And then Jaron would have been my next pick instead of quickly at 15th. Okay. Yeah. So what are we doing? Are we adjusting the board? How are we doing this? Uh, I think we should finish it out, and then okay. maybe we can go back and adjust. Okay. So so it's your pick at number 20. So here's the issue. <laughs> there are, like, th- there's one guy I really want to pick, just because he needs to be immortalized in here. But then there's a couple guys that have to be picked or else people are going to be really angry. So I'm, like, balancing a couple of those things. I'm going to give some love to a player that needs a little bit more love right now, Ben. Uh, he's in a pretty dark place. Oh, he's no. He's on a pretty dark team. Oh, no. For, You're doing it. For number 20, I got to I gotta pick Cade Cunningham, Ben. I got to pick Cade. Wow. Yeah, I do. I got to pick wow. Cade. Wow. Okay. Seems like you don't agree with that. I, I I would say I did not have Cade on my radar, but that's eh, not quite right because I know Cade's game pretty well. Yeah. I just I just think the players that I want to take here, I'm probably more comfortable taking than Cade. But but you're going to make a very interesting argument. I think you're going to make a fascinating argument. Wow. Which that's is that I'm just trying to read the tea leaves because this is the only way, right? You're you're going to argue that the Detroit situation is suppressing all of his numbers and growth and messing everything up, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that's key. It's not I, I don't necessarily I mean, love like I want Cade to be a better passer than he is. I think that's a key part of it, right? But I also don't know how to watch. Like I try and slow down a lot of possessions when I watch the Pistons play offense and I try and think I'm like, "All right, what better pass was open for Cade?" And there's not a lot of times where I'm like, "You should have made this pass. You would have made this guy open here." And I just, that team is such a mess, such a mess offensively. And he's given it his absolute all in these last couple of games. I think when they broke the record for the most losses uh, in a row, like Cade had just a ridiculous second. He had like 32 points in the second half. But a lot of those weren't like replicable on a great team. They were a lot of tough, like pull up mid range jumpers. But then he still had a couple of like strong drives, getting to the basket, finishing these and one types of layoffs. And so I like his, like, loping driving ability. Like, he's not the most athletic guy, but I think he's got a strong driving game that could be leveraged a little bit more if he was surrounded by some better shooting and better decision-making and things like that. And defensively, I think he has some tools. He knows how to rotate on the back line fairly well. He's big enough to actually cause, you know, a team to actually have to think about some things back there. I don't know. I could see him existing fairly well, maybe even as, like, a sixth man on a playoff team. Uh, you definitely want to see like an offensive on-off that's positive on a team like the Pistons, um, but I'm not sure. I test. I feel like I could I could see him on a better team. That was a, that was a really good argument. I hope the I hope the folks listening who are like, what are Cade Cunningham? He's in the 40th percentile in like every stat in the league. When you pull up his player card on thinkingbasketball.net, it's all orange because he's in the bottom half of all these stats. I think that was a great argument. If you, you know, 80 something percent from the free throw line, pretty good from the mid range. I think he's at 43% right now on the season. He can pass. He's a big body. I like what you said about him defensively. I'm fascinated to see how he would do as a second or third option. Um, The shooting is the big question mark, but if you, you just look at the last five games alone, as of recording this, he's had two 40 point games, 32 points, seven assists, Really good efficiency in some of these games. I mean, I, I like it's a good argument, Cody. It's a good argument. This is this is why we do the show. We're also definitely going to have to fix the draft order at the end because we can't immortalize Alperin Shengun and his push for the All Star game and Kate Cunningham and the twenty seven game win streak being next uh, to each other. We'll adjust it after these next few picks. Yeah, uh, I don't know what to do anymore. I don't know what to do. I'm going to. <sighs> I'm going to give love to a player who puts up the numbers. The question is, which one? Which one of these players who puts up the numbers, who gets the buckets, should I give the love to? That is the question. Uh, I guess I'll take Paolo Bencaro. Okay, good. Yep. I was hoping he was going to get picked here. Yep. We've already talked about him, so I pass it back to you. So he was one of those guys that I thought had to get picked before we uh, ended the show. Before, All right. before we wrapped, yeah. So what, I have two picks left. Yeah. All right, this is gonna, good. 
Yeah. Are you going to take another bucket getter? This is great. I'm not going to take another bucket getter. Ben. Okay. I might have to take another bucket. I don't know what to do with these other role players. I don't know what to do with them. There's like a class of player that we haven't picked. Yes. Yes, there is. Yes, and we're stuck in it. This is why we need to end the show fast, Cody. Quick, get out of here. Jaden McDaniels at number 22. <laughs> He's next on my board. Yes. Uh, He's so good defensively, Ben. He's so good defensively. So, so good, good defensively. He can shoot the ball. He can Me- drive in sometimes. Me- he's a mediocre shooter. No, yeah. I said he can shoot. I didn't say yeah, he can shoot. He can shoot. He's not Trey <laughs> Murphy the third. He can, he, can, he can get the ball and drive into the basket and, and attack a closeout, things like that. Yeah, I don't know what to do with all these guys. Um, Jaden McDaniels was next on my board. I'm so glad you you picked him and took the stress away from me. I have to See, this is the problem with going first. I have two more picks. I have two more picks. With one of my picks, I'm going to I'm gonna take a bucket getter. Okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm very concerned about the whole the the defense of it all. I'm very concerned about it. Um, there's two bucket getters I'm looking at. Hopefully, you don't make me take both of them. I might. I think I might. <sighs> I, I I really. It's like, do I take a bucket getter or do I get these role players? The role players, um, the type of player we're talking about. Well, I'll mention it in a second. I, I'm. Okay, let me take Anthony Simons. Ooh, okay, okay. Yeah. What is he shooting like fifty percent on wide open threes? Yeah, he's like he's a nuclear shooter, ridiculous off the bounce scoring game. Um, I kind of worry about all the other stuff, but I like. Can you have a six man microwave scorer who can hold up defensively? Who should be picked in this position? This class of player that balances against the guy starting over him, who's a good role player. And like plays defense and might hit some threes on a high level team. I I have no idea. I have no idea. Can I throw out some players in general that I struggled with that I'm not going to take next? Yeah, because it's your last pick. So yeah, for it. I I didn't know how to handle guys like Anthony Simons or Tyler Hero yep. or Cam Thomas. Yep. And they're great microwave scores. You can definitely see them existing on a team, but I don't. I just. I don't know. I don't necessarily love their creation. I don't think they're the most efficient scorers like ever. There's something that's like holding them back. And then defensively, they all have these holes. And so maybe that's my bias that I don't necessarily love those kinds of players. But those are guys that I'm just not going to be picking next, Ben. <laughs> I'm just not going to be picking them. <laughs> you have one pick left. What are you going to yeah. do? I'm so glad I'm getting this guy. My, uh, can, I, my... can, I, can I ask you a question? Please. Are, are you going to pick a player from the South? No. Okay. My one goal today was to pick this guy. That was my one goal, is I want to end up with him. And I want to st- I want to see your reaction. I want to see if he was on your radar at all. I'm taking Denny Avdia. Oh, yeah. He's on my radar. Yes, he is on your radar, Ben. Yeah. Because yeah. you know ball, Ben. You yeah. know ball. <laughs> Denny Avdia is like a poor man Scotty Barnes. He's just massive. He's an incredibly flexible defender. He's probably the most underrated defender and most underrated passer in the league at the same time. And again, he's just massive. He's like 6'9 out there. He knows how to cut. Like He's great at timing out those cuts, and he's great at making these passes off those cuts. I want him to shoot the ball better, but of course if he shot the ball better, he'd be like 12th on my list. Um, I just don't want him to be on the Wizards. The Wizards has too many guys between like Daniel Gafford and Tyus Jones and Bilal Koulibaly and and Corey Kispert and Denny Avdia, all these guys I want to see on different teams, but they just need other parts to really showcase their greatness. And Denny Avdia is definitely a guy that has greatness to give to a playoff team. Yeah, this is the best part of this exercise to me, which is no one watches the Washington Wizards. (laughs) So we just upset 29 fan bases whose player in the last slot could have been picked. But the reality is, Denny Avdia is a really good defender. He's got great feel. He doesn't try to do too much. Uh, like you said, passer, extra passer. What are his shooting numbers? Can he shoot? Eh. I don't eh. even know. We don't need to yeah. look it up. It's we not don't, great. Don't, don't it's check really not it. Great. <laughs> don't check it. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. He's solid. He's solid. He was definitely on my radar. I don't think I would have picked him. Okay. If, it, if you bounced it back to me and you didn't take him, I don't think I would have picked him. The guy I thought you were going to take was Jalen Johnson. I, I thought that's who you were talking of about. Of Atlanta, and then also Wendell Carter Jr., who's like your favorite player ever. I thought you might take him. Yeah. 
I don't know. He's having quite a down year, and I know he was injured and all that. Well, stuff. he's injured. He's injured. Yeah. yeah. So. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with any of these players. All this kind of like wiry fifth starter, Derek Lively, Nick Claxton. Do you protect the rim? What's going on with Nick Claxton? Why are his numbers all down? What's what's happening in Brooklyn? Can you help me? I don't know. Claxton's interesting. He had like a he grabbed a defensive rebound, and like brought it down the other day, and like Cody. spun and hit a hook shot. Oh, oh, I love the end of the episode for everyone who sticks around to listen. Like, dude, Cody, help me with Nick Claxton. He grabbed a defensive <laughs> rebound the other day. That was that was your answer. I um, love Nick Claxton. I thought maybe Nas Reed. I hate that Cole Anthony isn't about to be picked. Uh, I thought maybe you were going to be hot and tell me Jaime Hawkes. Should be another. I thought that makes the I list. no. I I don't. I have need to see more. But I actually was wondering how high you could rank Jaime Hawkes in an exercise like this. I, I'm so mad at you for not taking Tyler Hero. This really feels like if you're going to take Anthony Simons, you also have to take. What about Keegan Murray? What do you think about Keegan Murray? He um he would have been my next pick. Damn. He would have been my next pick. Because like, I think I have to take Keegan Murray, yeah. or I have to be consistent and take. Because I was like Tyler Hero and Anthony Simons, they're very similar people. I don't know if you know that. They're, 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 yes, they're very similar. I don't know why they look like the exact same player statistically. Oh boy, um, do I trust enough in Keegan? Mar- if we don't take Tyler Hero, is, Miami's going to be very mad at us, right? Who cares? Oh no, I care. <laughs> I. <laughs> That's a great city. Have you ever been to Miami? I haven't been to Miami. Actually. You don't want the whole city of Miami mad at you. He's he's good. I want him to be a better passer, and I want him to be a better defender. Um, he can definitely score, though. Okay, so if I don't take Tyler Hero, Miami's going to be mad at me. We agree. Sure. Okay, I'm going to take Keegan Murray. Yes. Yes, I think that's the right pick. I- I'm going to take Keegan Murray. Now, before we before we wrap up the show, how, how, do, we, how do we reconcile... How do we reconcile the the great draft debacle of of 2024 here? I would have taken Shen Gun at let's say I think I probably would have taken him. Well, I definitely would have taken him 13th over Wemby. Okay. Okay, so let's leave it there. Let's say let's say Mobley goes 11th. Okay. You take is, Garland. You take Garland twelfth. Yep. I would have taken Shengun. Does that break the draft? Would you start taking different players? So if you take Shengun at thirteen, yeah, then Wemby would be available. You're not taking him, right? Nope. So I still would have taken Jalen Williams. Yep. All right. Uh, so th- then I would. Then I would have taken Jaron Jackson Jr. Okay. Yep. I would not have taken quickly there, so I still would have taken Trey Murphy. Trey Murphy. Then I would have taken quickly. Yep. Then what happens? So I had Jaron after that. So would oh. you have taken Cade? Yeah, I probably would have taken Cade then. Okay, so you would have taken Cade. Wait a second. No, I take I take Wemby, then Cade, then quickly, and then it comes back to you at number 20. Who would you take? McDaniels? Probably. So we just move we just move all your stuff up one. Or Boncaro. Oh, you would have taken you would have taken Boncaro over Jade McDaniels. Yeah, I had him one spot ahead on my big board. Okay. So Boncaro goes there. Uh I would take uh this just breaks everything. I guess I'll take Simons. And then you would take who after that? Denny Avdia? Yes. Denny Avdia. And then I would take... And this, ruin, this ruins my whole shtick. Because I'd probably take Tyler Hero. Instead of Keegan Murray? No, I'd take Keegan Murray last. I have one more pick. Oh. Yeah, you have an extra, you have an extra pick at 24. Oh. All your, picks, w- got, all your picks got moved up one, one slot. I would have taken Keegan Murray then. Oh, you would have taken Keegan Murray at 24. Yeah. And then where does McDaniels go? Wait, did we not have him picked? No. I had McDaniels before Denny Avdia. Oh, so you would have done McDaniels. So I, I still, you would have done McDaniels, Hero, Denny Avdia, Keegan Murray. I was going to do Hero. No, I did Hero. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so there's the order. I have no idea what the list is. This Luke, <laughs> Luke, Luke, Luka Doncic first, Anthony Edwards second, Tyrese Halliburton third, John Morant fourth, Tyrese Maxey fifth, Scotty Barnes sixth, Chet Holmgren seventh, Lamelo Ball eighth, Zion Williamson ninth, Franz Wagner tenth rounds out the top ten. I was odds with the first pick. Cody was evens with the second pick. After that, we go Mobley, Garland. Now, the adjusted order is Shen Gun, Jalen Williams, Jaron Jackson Jr., Trey Murphy III, Victor Wembanyama, Cade Cunningham, Emmanuel Quickly, Paolo Boncaro, Anthony Simons, Jaden McDaniels, Tyler Hero, Denny Avdia, and Keegan Murray. 25 players under 25 years old. Whew. That was quite the exercise, Ben. To support this show, check out patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball. That's just the best way to support us. Uh, we, I, don't, I have no energy left for an outro. So, yeah. I have a, I'll tease something. I'll tease something. That's how we can end. Send all your messages to at Cody Hodak on Twitter in capital letters. I have a story from the Northwoods of Wisconsin when I was visiting my parents. I, I got a story that I'll, I'll have to tell next time. And I had to deal with an animal encounter. And uh, I, th- I think the people would like to hear it. Thanks, as always, for listening to this one all the way through. And, of course, I hope you're having a great day.